that today is uh, um, cannot be here for personal reasons. Uh, we have here Professor Antonio Insoria, who led the ASSO particle physics group in, in the past. So then uh, it's my pleasure to welcome again uh, Professor Dimitri, and we can start our. Thank you. I can talk. Thank you. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thanks again for the invitation. Uh, I'm always very happy to to come here to Catania, even for a few hours like today. Uh, so I will give you today an overview of the recent advances in the observation of energy cosmic rays. Uh, I was told that uh, the audience is maybe not, not fully familiar with the topic. Of course, there are experts in the field, but also experts in other uh, disciplines oh, and uh, fields of physics. So I, I will try to be uh, to have the, the right equilibrium um, in going deep or not into the details. Uh, so I will start uh, with a brief history and the early measurements. This is always a good way to get familiar with uh, with a topic, uh, at least to me. Uh, then I will jump to nowadays and uh, give a short review of the most important and most recent results in the field. And I will, and of course, I will concentrate at the end on ideas for the future. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have so much time to go uh, to, to explore the whole field. So we'll focus on charged cosmic rays. Uh, so we'll not cover the topics of gamma rays and neutrinos. Of course, I will uh, I will uh, just quote them. Uh, I'm sorry for this, also because here uh, there is a big group of Chem3Net, and then uh, but they know even more than me on neutrino astronomy, for sure. Okay, so we first uh, we we deal with cosmic messengers. Uh, so apart from gravitational waves that came last in the picture a few years ago with the first observation, we have these handles to study a, a very far astrophysical objects, which are uh, charged cosmic rays. So unfortunately for charged cosmic rays, the path is really strange because they encounter magnetic fields everywhere, mainly in our galaxy and then in our solar system and then very close to the Earth. So the part is not straightforward, so you cannot recognize the sources, so you cannot do astronomy with charged particles, unless you are at very, very high energy, and then I will be back on this. Uh, so you expect those particles to come close to the atmosphere and then start interacting and produce a, a set of secondary cosmic rays, which is what we observe here at sea level. In the main object, during the same process that lead to very high energy charged cosmic rays, you also produce photons and neutrinos. Of course, studying photons is straightforward. Well, it's easier maybe than neutrino. Uh, and uh, likely enough, of course, they do not suffer or deviations due to the magnetic field. So you can do astronomy with photons, of course, uh, as a human being started uh, centuries ago. Uh, but you have also another messenger, which are neutrinos. In the case of neutrinos, of course, you don't have, uh, even in this case, any deviation. Uh, but uh, there, is a, there is something more for neutrinos because they interact very weakly with matter. So this means that they can escape the very inner part of astrophysical objects where the density is so high that photons cannot escape. So neutrinos can. Uh, and you can detect neutrinos, so they bring more information and different information, I would say, with respect to photons. Unfortunately, for the same reason, the low cross section, it's very difficult to, to detect them on the Earth. So you need, while you need relatively um, reasonable experimental technique and apparatus, apparatus to detect photons, to detect neutrinos, you need huge volumes in very strange situations as we will see. OK, let's go back uh, um, to the, the end of in, in the 1800s. Uh, these were the times where uh, during which the uh, Eiffel Tower were 
was built. And you see it was just done in two years, which is very uh, is, is, is astonishing if you compare with the bureaucracy that we had to fight with in, in, in planning big experiments, even small experiments. So in two years it was done. And at that time uh, it was the tallest uh, building uh, in, in, in the world. Uh, so someone had the idea to climb, not to climb, to, to go to the highest level and measure the um, the radioactivity that was present in, in air. Uh, I mean, uh, at that time, they had this uh, kind of detectors which uh, measured the radioactivity present in the air, the ionization rate, rate let's say, uh, present in the air. Uh, due to this ionization, due to the presence of this free charge, uh, there was a discharge of this of this device, and uh, the discharge rate was proportional to the ionization rate in the air. The uh, origin of this ionization in the air was uh, attributed to natural radioactivity from the Earth's crust, which is what you suppose. Uh, so you would expect that go, going up uh, uh, to the top of the Eiffel Tower, you, uh, you have to measure something less with respect to what you have at the, um, and on, the, on the floor, on the ground. <clears throat> uh, in principle, this happened. So you see here the ionization rate as a function of the altitude, and you see a small decrease, but this was not sufficient, so someone else uh, so namely Victor S and also collaborators, uh, managed to, to measure the same um, radioactivity level in the air, so the ionization rate, as a function of eight using balloons, and they reached, you see here, even more than eight kilometers. And they measured this rate that was increasing uh, as a function of the eight. So, uh, this is a spectacular demonstration that this origin, the origin of the ionization rate in the air, is not due to something that is coming from the Earth's crust. It's due to something that is coming from outside the Earth. Uh, similar kind of experiments were done by Domenico Pacini in Italy uh, using a different idea. So putting underwater his device and to measure the absorption rate, and also in this case, the results was compatible to an extraterrestrial origin of this um, um, cause of ionization of air. Then in those years, there were a lot of experiments by crazy people. You see here the, 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 the departure uh, of the Explorer 2 mission in 1935 that reached 22 kilometers in eight. So they had a small uh, press, pressurized uh, cabin that was um, um, flown using a balloon. Uh, you see here other missions here. And, and the, so they measured all these ionization rates as a function of the aid with a lot of results that they didn't understand so clearly. And so there was, there was a debate at that time, even among famous scientists like uh, Millikan, who actually uh, invented the name cosmic rays and Compton. Milligan's uh, hypothesis was that those cosmic rays were made by photons, while Compton suggested that they were charged particles. So Compton suggested to measure the flux of cosmic rays on Earth um, in, uh, in different uh, locations of the Earth. Uh, so they, in, in the 30s, they found that there was a dependence on the geomagnetic field, so the geomagnetic latitude. So uh, this is a clear footprint and a demonstration, let's say, that those, charge, uh, those rays are charged particles because they uh, are influenced by the geomagnetic field. So Compton was right and Millikan was wrong. Uh, so... Uh, Till these days, uh, if you wanted to, to study uh, subatomic sub, or subatomic physics, let's say so you have to, to deal with nuclear physics and nuclear decays or radioactivities. So now the uh, cosmic rays were discovered, so people started study, studying them all around the world. Bruno Rossi was one uh, of the main uh, 
uh, actor in, in those years. He invented many techniques, for example, the electronic consonant techniques was invented by Bruno Rossi. And in those years, he went to uh, Eritrea, and you might understand why Eritrea during the 30s, um, to measure cosmic rays with simple devices like this. You have here two Gagger uh, Mueller tubes with some absorber. So you have a trigger put, putting the two counters in coincidence, and then you measure the, the flux of cosmic rays as a function of the zinc angle. So this is what you do during the International Cosmic Days. <laughs> Uh, so he, he took this angle, 0, 15, 30, and so on, uh, and he found a slight uh, uh, asymmetry among the cosmic rays coming from the west and east. And in fact, this is uh, suggesting uh, us that uh, charged cosmic rays are mainly positively charged, because if you play with Lorentz force, then you, you see that if you have a particle coming from the vertical direction, uh, given the direction of the logomagnetic fields, you expect those particles to be deviated in a direction such that you would see an asymmetry of part or an excess of particles coming from west. This is a tiny effect, but it's there. And he also uh, found that sometimes there were some coincidences among the detectors which were very far. And this was the discovery, the first hints, let's say, or measurements that were done uh, subsequently by others, for example, Pierre Auger. So this was, these were the first things that uh, um, often those cosmic rays at Earth comes in uh, uh, showers of particles. Uh, so now we know that we have the primary cosmic rays impinging the atmosphere at 20 kilometers of weight, producing secondary particles, and then at sea level you see a lot of muons and other particles. The muons, roughly 300 muons per square meter. Uh, per second. So this is the picture that we know now. Uh, this is a simulation, of course. Uh, this is a proton shower um, uh, with an energy of 10 TeV. So you see uh, with simulation, of course, you can distinguish muons, electrons, and addons in the shower. Uh, you see how many particles you have, and you see how big is the surface which is uh, reached by the same uh, um, shower. Uh, so, uh, people uh, continue uh, studying cosmic rays. This is a conference in the fifth, in 1950, uh, it's the early 50s, as far as I remember. Uh, in, uh, no, sorry, this is in 39, sorry, I was wrong. In 39, so before uh, World War II in, uh, in Chicago. And here you see many of your uh, uh, influencer. <laughs> Because you you see here uh, Professor Eisenberg, Victor S. with his cosmic rays, Bruno Rossi, uh, uh, I think this is Oppenheimer, uh, Compton, uh, Bete, and so you you have a lot of them. Uh, so this is just to tell you that studying cosmic rays during the following years, the antimatter was discovered by Anderson in '32, and then pions, kaons. Uh, um, sigma and so on, till uh, let's say mid 50s. Okay, so subatomic physics was studied those days using cosmic rays. Then something happening in the 50s, which is the start of the, the so called energy physics area. So people started uh, using uh, accelerated particles accelerator uh, of particles. And this is the first uh, spectacular uh, experiment uh, to me. Uh, this is the, the discovery of the antiproton that was made at uh, Bevatron, so in Berkeley. It was a machine accelerating protons till uh, few GeV. So there was a target here. So with a the magnetic selection, they selected negatively charged particles because they were looking for antiprotons. Then you have the classical scheme here. So you have a first dipole, a second dipole. So you deviate the beam and you select the, de the deviated particles so that you measure the momentum. Then you have two uh, quadrupole to focus the beam. And then 
fuel scintillator, S1, S2, and S3, just three scintillator to trigger and to measure time of flight. Uh, so at the end, uh, now in, in this beam, you mainly have uh, antiprotons, if any, if they exist, and negatively charged pions. And then you have to distinguish pi minus by antiproton. Of course, uh, they have the same momentum, so the pions are much faster, so you measure the time of flight uh, and you get it. But this is not sufficient because the background was high and you had all the order of one antiproton per uh, 10 to 5 pions. So they, they use another kind of detector and this young guy is Thomas Ypsilantis. Then you might get that those detectors were Cherenkov detectors. This is one of the first time, the first use of Cherenkov detectors in uh, particle high energy physics, let's say. So they use the Cherenkov effect. Of course, pions were producing Cherenkov light and not protons because they were slower. And so they were able to, to pick up those few event due to antiprotons and reconstruct the, the shape of the antiproton mass, which is picked at one proton mass, as you see. So they found a particle with the same mass of a proton, but opposite charge. And uh, I encourage you to, to go and see and read this paper. It's just three pages dated, dating back 55. Uh, of course, they got the Nobel Prize, in particular Chamberlain and Segre got the Nobel Prize for this. And this is maybe the birth of this spectacular series of experiments made with accelerators that uh, till the discovery of the Higgs boson, let's say. So uh, precision high energy physics was done uh, with accelerators. And in the meantime, cosmic ray physics was used, let's say, to um, un better understand the astrophysical objects and the astrophysical mechanisms that produce those particles up to these high energies. Nowadays, we, uh, this is the only way to reach very high energies. So uh, even if you want to understand the energy physics, so fundamental physics at the highest energies or in very exotic uh, um, uh, conditions, uh, the only way is to go back and study cosmic rays. In the same years, so mid 50s, another uh, rush just started, which which was the rush for the uh, space exploration. So you might know that the first object in orbit uh, uh, launched in orbit was launched in 57. This was the Sputnik 1. Uh, this is exactly the same year that Christensen and Kulikov discovered the all party or knee uh, studying uh, extensive showers. This is a note for those of you that uh, study cosmic rays that are familiar with the knee of the spectrum. But anyway, just uh, uh, less less than one month after the launch of Sputnik 1, Sputnik 2 was launched. And in, the, in Sputnik 2, we already have a, fair, uh, a cosmic ray detector in space. So the first cosmic ray in, uh, detector in space was uh, the second object launched in space. This is the same mission uh, where the the famous Laika dog was launched in the cabin. Um, this mission was uh, using Geiger-Muller tubes to detect cosmic rays, and they detected anomalous counting rate above a given altitude. This is a detail of the mission. This was the detector, two Geiger-Muller tubes, 10 centimeters long. Uh, with the first transistor and diodes in space, they were placed just above the location of the cabin hosting uh, the little dog. And they expected these measurements, but uh, found this very strange rate. Now we know that this was due to the detector crossing the Van Allen belts. You might know that due to the, the shape of the magnetic field around the Earth, some very low energy <clears throat> charged particles, charged cosmic rays are trapped in these belts around the Earth. And when you cross uh, going around the Earth, those regions, there, are, there is an anomalous increase in the counting rate. Uh, they were not able to claim the discovery of these belts uh, for, um, for a funny reason, just because there they were no uh, memory elements on board. And they sent data to ground, but with uh, in a coded way, because they I didn't want any other outside Soviet Union to uh, have the data. So they only have the data 
uh, of the region above Soviet Union skies, let's say. And uh, this prevented them to, to have a clear picture and to claim the discovery of this belt that are not called the Vernov belt, or Vernov was the PI of the mission, but are called the Van Allen belts. And this is why in, in the same days, Van Allen made another uh, mission in the US, I will tell you why. So Sputnik 3 was even more complicated. Uh, the first Cherenkov counter was sent to space. 1958 is not so many years after the discovering of the Cherenkov effect. Sodium ionized interleukin counters and the first silicon solar battery. Uh, so uh, I was quoting Van Allen. So here's Van Allen uh, with his collaborator launching uh, Explorer 1, 2, and 3 and 4 just after the Russians. And so they managed to, to discover this structure around the Earth that then was, were called Van Allen belts. And they also made this spectacular proof of the existence of Van Allen belts. They injected electrons in the Van Allen belts and, and they sent this probe around the space to measure uh, the increase in the flux of electrons after the injection. So how do you inject electrons in the Van Allen belts? Just organizing atomic explosion, nuclear explosion. During those years, these funny things were possible. And you see here a table where you see nominal yield of, of the explosion, one or two kilotons. These were rocket launched by US Navy from the South Pacific. And those explosions were arranged. The project Argus was the name of the project. And uh, so they injected electrons, be the rays from um, uh, from the explosion, and they located the increase, they detected with, with, with the Explorer satellite, the increase of the electroflux uh, above a given uh, a given latitude. So they confirmed the existence of these belts and then, then called the Northern belts. Again, the same year, in gr uh, at ground, people continued studying those stuff. They uh, started using this approach, so to study high energy particles, they had the, this idea the, yeah, with a, with a, within an experiment in the Pamir uh, using uh, absorbers and uh, detectors. So this is maybe the first uh, segmented uh, hadronic calorimeter in our language that then we use, was used uh, at accelerators um, and with beautiful results, as we know. And that even they managed to send this in space <laughs> Uh, this was a, uh, an experiment was called uh, Proton, and they used uh, rockets that were uh, built uh, for uh, for uh, military use, of course, during the, the Cold War. Uh, but instead of hosting uh, bombs, they, uh, they were just hosting this uh, very heavy uh, instrument. You see here 12.5 tons, which is a huge number for the space payload. Uh, even at the limit of nowadays technology, and they managed to measure maybe the knee of the particle spectrum, so they reached energy of the order of 1 PV, 10 to 15 electron volt, and they also had some uh, hint of the increase of the proton-proton cross-section as a function of energy that then was confirmed at CERN and then at Fermilab, but then again at CERN with LHC. Of course, on the other side of the ocean in, in US, many other uh, progress were made. I don't have time to do, go into the details, of course, and then I will stop here this historic review just to see how things started in ground and in space, studying cosmic rays. So what, what do, do we have to, to answer to? Uh, what are the basic questions? First, uh, what are the sources of cosmic rays? This is something that still uh, do, do not understand. We have, we have some answers now, but not totally, uh, not all of them. Uh, how do cosmic accelerators work? They are much more efficient than uh, what we can do on Earth, uh, at least in terms of the energy that can be reached. And what happens during cosmic ray propagation in the galaxy? Uh, but all these, uh, questions has to be answered during these observables. What we can measure 
around the Earth is the energy of a particle, the identification, the ID of this particle, and the arrival direction. So energy spectra, arrival direction, and chemical composition, what we call chemical composition. All this is done with many tools uh, and many instruments on ground. So if you're on ground, you are measuring the secondary cosmic rays produced uh, at 15, 20 kilometers of height after the arrival of the primary cosmic rays. So from their characteristics, you have to reconstruct the properties of the primary particle using many observables, um, particle detector counters, Cherenkov telescopes, uh, fluorescence telescopes, uh, even radio antenna and so on. Or if you are uh, working in the right energy range, you can also send a detector to space and directly measure the primary cosmic rays. Of course, this is the best way if you can do. Uh, so you have a lot of uh, solutions to, to many problems. You go underground. Uh, this is an old picture of an experiment below Gansasso. Uh, you go to, to the mountain like uh, the Oje case or in Tibet, but you also go deep underwater or under ice. And these are the, our landscapes. So uh, what we get from the sky is charged particles, and this is the energy spectrum of the various components. You get neutrinos and you get photons. Um, for the charged particles, you see, as a first approximation, the energy spectrum is a power law with some structure. The first structure was discovered, as I told you, in the 50s, and it was called the Ni of the spectrum, which is the so-called all, part all particle spectrum. So you sum together all the charged particles. Now we know that all those particles are atomic nuclei, so proton, hydrogen, and so on, up to iron and more. Uh, and then you have maybe other other structure here, and then you see uh, um, a cutoff or uh, um, a suppression around 10 to 20 electron volt, which seems to be the end of this energy spectrum. Of of course, if you can, you can also measure the subcomponents, which are electrons, positrons, antiprotons, and so on. I will come back to this. Uh, on the same source, you also produce neutrinos. Uh, and photons. And you see here, this is the photon spectrum as a function of energy and wavelength. This is a very old picture, but it's very beautiful be because you see uh, all the emissions and uh, uh, spanning over many orders of magnitude in energy and in flux. If you uh, look, for example, in the visible energy range, so roughly one electron volt, this is the the the, the star of light. As, uh, oh, sorry, the, the the light of the stars as we can see them uh, during uh, the night with our eyes. If you go uh, to smaller energies, you go to infrared, and then you get to radio wave, and then you had, uh, and even before you uh, you go to microwave, and this is the famous uh, cosmic microwave background. So the um, a black body spectrum peaked at a temperature of 2.7 Kelvin. While if you go higher in energy, uh, you always have again Maxwell Boltzmann or black body distribution. Then you start having a power law uh, when you reach, let's say, X ray, hard X rays, and, M -M, um, and gamma rays. So uh, you go from uh, thermal phenomena, thermal emission uh, phenomena, to non-thermal uh, phenomena. And most probably those non-thermal phenomena, given a power law here, are strongly linked to the same mechanism that produce cosmic rays because of the power law. <clears throat> At the same time, you produce neutrinos. So you know very well that the sun produces neutrinos, and this is the yellow spectrum. When you have a supernova explosion, you also might have neutrinos. In all those cases, you have neutrinos producing nuclear interactions. So the energy is of the order of few MeV. Uh, even if you have a nuclear plant reactor on Earth, you, you produce those neutrinos, antineutrinos in this case, with the same energy, more or less. <clears throat> if you go uh, higher in energy, then you have this called atmospheric neutrinos. 
these are produced by cosmic rays uh, hitting the atmosphere and producing secondary particles, for example, pions and kaons. And then you have neutrinos from uh, the decay of charged pions mainly. Uh, so those neutrinos are not coming from uh, extraterrestrial sources. They are produced in the atmosphere as secondary particles. Uh, while if you go higher in energy, you might start getting neutrinos from the extraterrestrial sources. Uh, and this is the pink spectrum, which is uh, very interesting to be studied. Even higher in energy, you have this called the cosmic genic neutrinos, which are uh, most probably the result of an interaction of very high energy protons at 20 to 20 electron volts with the cosmic microwave background photons as a target. Then we produce a delta resonance and then you might produce charged pions and then neutrinos. So you see extremely high energy with extremely low energy, which brings you to this very energy cosmogenic neutrino flux. On the other extreme, you have cosmological neutrinos, which is the, exactly the same uh, <coughs> spectrum as the cosmic microwave background in terms of photons. So you, for the same reason, you expect uh, also a neutrino flux to be there. These are very difficult to detect. If you have a, a smart idea, you will get the Nobel Prize <laughs> for sure, because look at the energy. These are, this is a fraction of milli electron volt. Uh, so these are even non-relativistic neutrinos. Very strange beast to, to deal with. Uh, okay, so come back to um, charged particles. So this is the spectrum, again, as a function of energy. Uh, if you go very low in energy, you see that there are deviations from a power law. This is simply due to the fact that there are local effects. So you have, for example, the, if the magnetic field generated by the sun that in the solar system prevents very low energy cosmic rays to enter the region. Uh, so the flux at very low energy is somehow cut off, uh, cutted because of the effect of the, of the solar magnetic field. And this is also time dependent. So you have a modulation of low energy fluxes in this region here, which is dominated by local effects. On the other hand, if you go very high in, in energy, most probably those cosmic rays above, let's say, 10 to 18 electron volt uh, could be from uh, extragalactic origin. So if you want to start focusing on cosmic rays producing our galaxy, this is the energy range that you should focus. So above, uh, let's say, 10 GV and below 10 to 17 electron volt. And here, um, at, at the low energy part can be studied with satellites in space because the flux is still high enough. While if you go larger in energy, for example, above 10 to 15 electron volts, so 1 PV, take this number as a reference. If you go above 1 PV, uh, the flux is too small. So a reasonable sized uh, payload cannot have uh, um, a reasonable rate of event to be studied. So you are forced to study high energy cosmic rays using uh, ground-based detectors. <clears throat> uh, so let, let's start seeing just some example. This is the, the so-called all electron flux. So the sum of cosmic electrons and positrons as a function of energy. You see many experiments and you see this is really nice, everything is fitting uh, the picture, but this is a, a, a dirty trick, I would say, because look how many orders of magnitude I put it here in the slide. So in all cosmic ray physics, typically what you plot on the y-axis is not the flux, but the flux multiplied by a power of the energy. So for example, this is this is looking like uh, e to the minus three as, uh, as a function of energy. So I multiply the flux to e to the minus three, and, I, and then I expect uh, an horizontal line. But then in this case, I will also emphasize all the changes of slopes and so on. So if you do this, if you multiply the flux by a power of the energy, you see that the, the picture is different. So you see we made different experiments. They are not agreeing to each other very well. Again, at low energies, so below 10 JV, there is a modulation due to these local effects. 
And uh, you don't know, maybe there is a cutoff around one TV. This might be due to the fact that electrons are uh, much lighter than protons. So they suffer much more than protons energy losses due to synchrotron effect in external magnetic fields. And then you expect uh, to have a cutoff somewhere here. Uh, then there are also models suggesting that you might have a bump here at energies of tens of TV because of local sources. This will be a very spectacular detection of a local source if we, we, we were able to reach those energies. So this is the picture um, till, uh, let's say, 60 years ago. Then uh, the dump experiment found these spectacular results in uh, 2017. Uh, uh, the, uh, a break in the electron flux was detected around 1 TV. And, and now, uh, so this is confirming the fact that uh, electrons suffer um, energy loss processes much more than protons, as you expect. Now, what, what is interesting is to explore the energy range around 10 TV. So uh, this is more or less the same energy of the beam at LHC. Uh, these are electrons in this case. Uh, those en this energy range should be explored because if you see a bump here, this will be a demonstration of the contribution of local uh, cosmic resources in terms of electrons and positrons. Uh, I can skip this. Uh, why the electron channel is so important? Because if you have a magnetic field on board, so if you have a spectrometer, you can distinguish electrons from positrons. And this is what Pamela, the Pamela experiment made a few years ago. So you can study the positrons alone. In particular, what is studied in this plot is the so-called positron fraction. So the flux of positrons divided by the flux of positrons plus electrons. And if you your understanding of the universe is the following, so the universe is mainly made of matter. You have uh, stars made of matter, and then cosmic rays are accelerated during uh, using solar matter. Then uh, you might have antimatter only as a result of uh, interaction of cosmic rays with some target material, which is close by the source or during uh, encounter during the propagation. So in this way, so if secondary, if positrons are produced by this secondary uh, production mechanism, you would expect, as is emphasized here by the continuous line, uh, a decrease of the positron fraction as a function of energy. But the experimental result was by Pamela or, uh, is, is this set of red points. So you see that there is a clear contradiction. You see an increasing fraction of positrons while you expect uh, a decreasing um, fraction. Then people started to, to think about possible production of positrons because of uh, decay of WIMPs, of dark matter, and other exotic phenomena. So this was the starting of a long uh, series of papers in the literature. Those measurements were confirmed later by <coughs> uh, AMS2, uh, which is a an even larger experiment installed on the International Space Station with a, a very large magnetic field and very precise uh, instrumentation that made possible uh, this very high quality data, as you see here. Uh, so still we see this increase with energy of the positron fraction with some decreasing here at this energy. And this is somehow puzzling. In, in this plot, you can see the shape multiplied by some power of energy again the shape versus energy of the electron spectrum and the shape of the positron spectrum. So you see that the electrons uh, are um, decreasing with energy faster than the positron signal, and uh, you might attribute this to some exotic uh, physics, but in what we know now it, it is that if you go deeper, into astrophysical models, those data can be explained with standard astrophysical production scenario. Uh, so the idea will be, let's look at antiprotons in cosmic rays. If, you, if we see an excess in anti-electrons, we should see an excess also in antiprotons. But this is not the case, because you see here uh, the results from Pamela, uh, the red points, uh, 
um, perfect agreement with the, the radical prediction of antiproton production due to secondary interaction of cosmic rays. Uh, you see also here on the plot the flux of antiprotons divided by the flux of protons compared with the prediction and the experimental data are still within uh, even at maybe at one sigma from the average still within the band of theoretical prediction uh, so this is a passing situation we see an excess of positrons we don't see an excess of antiprotons this might be due to the presence of local sources of electrons and positrons, as I uh, suggested, uh, showing you the, the, the results concerning electrons and positrons. You also see here those colored bands. These are the uncertainties on the theoretical calculation. Uh, so you see here that for the first time, uh, this is just one example, when you see that uh, the, the outcome of the measurement is mostly influenced by the uncertainty in this radial model. And this is due mainly, you see, to the uh, poor knowledge of cross-section of uh, production of antiprotons at low energy. So there is a set of interesting experiments that should be done using BIN uh, on Earth in order to measure the, those cross-section and then uh, make this uh, calculation uh, more precise in order to be compared with very precise uh, data. I skip this again and I come to this. So if you uh, want to go to other messengers, let's start looking at uh, protons and other nuclei. And here you see the flux of protons and helium as a function of energy, again multiplied by some power of energy. As usual, at low energy you have the modulation due to the sun, and then you have some evolution with energy. What was expected till uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago what? was that this should, uh, should be a unique power law till 1 PV. Uh, but we see that there is a strange behavior here, and then there is maybe a change in the slope. This was this discovery made again by the Bamel experiment and then confirmed by EMS of this called hardening of the spectra. So at, at a given energy, if you under GV, uh, the energy spectra of protons and other nuclei are harder than what was expected. So this was the theoretical model, and these are experimental data. So again, there is an excess due to maybe uh, secondary sources, which are local, or uh, propagation effect. So what, what, what you have to do in this case is trying to go to higher energy to understand if this is still ongoing or not. This is an example taken from MS, which is showing you the same plots for different nuclei. You see protons, helium, lithium, oxygen, nitrogen, and so on. So in all those cases, you see that a given point, which is corresponding to a rigidity of two, 300 gigavolt, you have this hardening of the spectrum. Uh, in order to understand this, you should have more data at high energy. Uh, how much? Hi. Uh, well, with the current mission, we can reach, uh, let's say, 100 TV, maybe a few hundred TV in energy. Uh, this is essentially limited by the size of the detector. This is the proton spectrum multiplied by a power of the energy as a function of the energy. And this is the result of the Calette experiment, which is on board the International Space Station, which is confirming the hardening. And then we don't know what's happening here because you see that uh, experimental uncertainties are very high. <coughs> Again, here the Dampet satellite showed for the first time that the, this was this unexpected result. So after this hardening, we now observing uh, uh, um, above um, roughly 10 TV, a softening of the spectrum. This was confirmed by Calet in 22. And we also observed the same behavior with helium. Uh, so maybe there is uh, this bump due again to a presence of a local source or a change in the acceleration of production mechanism. We need more data at these energies, but look, in the meantime, we are in the in the region of uh, multi TV per nucleon, so it's very difficult. Uh, anyway, uh, we are trying to do to do this. This is one example for a heavier nucleus, uh, the flux of iron nuclei. You see in this case that uh, systematic uncertainties are larger because 
measurements here are affected by the fragmentation of nuclei. So we, we um, are able to model the physics of interaction of energy protons with a target, but when we have uh, an iron nucleus with an uh, initial kinetic energy of 100 TV, uh, you know, we, we have to extrapolate what we know from uh, accelerator data uh, to space and details of uh, nuclear models are um, still, uh, we still lack uh, a complete understanding of, the, of all these details and then we have still uh, systematics uh, in the adron interaction models which is the main reason for this systematic energy band the yellow band in this case for the galaxy experiment around these measurements so we are limited by this effect again uh, in the high energy regime i can skip this and also this uh, just a very fast view of this map. I told you that um, magnetic fields uh, completely determine the, um, uh, well, completely cancel the correlation uh, between uh, uh, the incoming direction and the source position in the sky for charged particles. So the cosmic reflux is isotropic, but this is not completely true. If you go to a given energy range, you see small uh, um anisotropies uh, if you look for the first order anisotropy which is a dipolar anisotropy then you see that the amplitude of this anisotropy is of the order of 10 to the minus 3 and this is the evolution of this amplitude as a function of energy you see many measurements you see a maximum around 10 tv which is the energy where uh, Dampe detected the softening in cosmic rays, so this might be related. And then you see that going towards a, a very high energy, above hundreds of TV, you have an increase of anisotropy. So again, something new is happening. Uh, if, you, if you look at the face of the dipole, uh, so the position of the dipole in the sky, this is an like even more spectacular effect because you see a position uh, phase of the dipole which is suddenly changing around uh, two, 300 GV, pointing toward the galactic center this time. All this could be a combination of the composition of the cosmic ray beam, which is changing with energy, and uh, the structure of the local uh, magnet galactic uh, magnetic field, the, the, the arm of the local galactic magnetic field, which still do not know very well. Uh, so the answer uh, should come from a larger experiment, and this is one proposal for a future experiment, which is called HERD. This is a larger and heavier experiment uh, that could reach uh, 10 to the 16 electron volt in energy to be installed on the Chinese space station. And there is a collaboration trying to um, <clears throat> propose this experiment, get this approved and, and build it. Uh, I don't go into the details, I will leave you the slides. Uh, so, if you want to study cosmic rays with satellites, you could reach 1 PV, and I showed you why you need to cover this energy region. If you want to go higher in energy, you should um, use data coming from ground-based experiments. In between, uh, there is a, a fight, a discussion, because you have two completely different approaches. So with direct measurements, uh, you typically use calorimeters or spectrometers. You need large acceptances in order to have uh, large statistics, very good resolution, and then you can very uh, precisely measure the energy spectrum and the incoming direction. You have limitations which are mainly due to the, the size of the payload. Uh, it's hard to reach the high energies. In particular, it's hard to reach the so-called all particle knee at 1 PV, and you need very high technology and uh, a very heavy technological effort for space measurements. On the other hand, if you stay on ground, then you better use different techniques in order to compare different results and try to decrease uh, the uncertainties due to the systematics. Uh, it will be better to operate at high altitude, it, but this depends on the energy of cosmic rays that you are interested in. Uh, then in this case, you have uh, 
you can reach the highest energies because you can build huge detector arrays on ground. You can you, then you have uh, very large statistics. Then you can detect very small anisotropies in the sky because you have many statistics, uh, very large statistics, and then you can detect uh, very small anisotropies. Uh, of course, you have limitations. In this case, you are dominated in some cases by systematics. So poor mass resolution. It's really hard to distinguish on the basis of the secondary particles at the ground if this particle was a proton or an helium nuclei, nucleus or an iron nucleus, uh, as you can imagine. Um, so you are intrinsically limited by systematics, and then you have a large model dependence, for example, a dronic model. All the results here and then the results of your analysis depends on the assumptions that you use here for the QCD, for example, at very high energies. In this case, you reach square root of S of the order of hundreds of TV, which are not yet explored. But even if you go to lower energies, you are in the very forward. Those particles are in the very forward direction, so at three, uh, very high pseudo rapidities, which are not covered at LHC, for example. Uh, there are um, um, measurements made by the LHCF experiment, for example, but they are not sufficient. The, you, you even uh, need even larger uh, rapidities uh, to compare um, those data with, with this one using cosmic rays. So you have to extrapolate models anyway, and this brings you system, uh, other systematics. But this is the only way to reach the highest energies. I skip this just to show what is the approach. Many of you might already know. Of course, this is the, the, the largest experiment, uh, cosmic ray experiment in the world. This is the, the Pierre Roger Observatory. It's covering a surface of more than 3,000 square kilometers. Each dot here is a particle detector like this. So it's a tank filled with water where charged particles produce chunk of light and then you detect secondary particles. Uh, in the meantime, uh, you also detect the scintillation light of charged particles produced in the atmosphere. Of course, this is possible only when you don't have sunlight, you don't have the moon and you don't have the clouds. So this limit yourself to around 10-15% of, of duty cycle. Uh, but if you can do this, the experiment is, uh, you can treat the atmosphere as an homogeneous calorimeter, so the energy measurements is really precise. Uh, and then you can use the data taken during these good nights uh, to compare what you measure with uh, the, the, the fluorescence telescope with, uh, with what you have uh, from the ground arrays. So you put together different observables, you have here on the horizontal axis the energy measured by the fluorescence detector, so the calorimetric technique that you can use only 10% of time. And you, you compare this with some observables that comes from the uh, so-called surface array, so all the, detect the charged particle detectors are ground, and then you see that there are correlations. So once you do this calibration, you have data uh, also during daytime, because you just need to use uh, charged particles at ground. And then with this kind of experiment, we, for example, were able to see very clearly the end of the cosmic ray spectrum around 10 to 20 electron volt. You see this sharp behavior here. Uh, there is a puzzling situation here concerning the composition. So you, we, we, uh, we understood, so in other words, we understood that uh, the spectrum is ending at these energies. We don't know yet what is the reason. There might be at least two. The simplest reason is that those um, particles are interacting with the cosmic microwave background and then uh, uh, the, the flux is suppressed. Uh, but what we don't know is um, the chemical composition of the beam. So we would uh, expect to have a, dominate, a beam dominated by protons at the highest energies, but data indicate uh, that this is not maybe the case. Uh, I, I have no time to go into the details, but you see that experimental points are not going at high energies towards the hypothesis of proton dominated beam, but they are going towards a composition that should be heavier. 
So they are approaching the iron curves, the iron prediction of the proton ones. And this is a puzzling situation. Anyway, maybe this is, the, um, this is one of the last things that I'm going to show. Uh, the most spectacular results in this field was obtained by the Auger collaboration a few years ago, showing that above a given energy, 8 times 18 electron volt, you start seeing an, an inoso, inosotropic sky. Uh, so you expect that at this very high energy, the galactic magnetic field is no more um, able to deviate uh, the direction of particles. Uh, you know, this just comparing the Larmor radius at this energy with the size of the galaxy. And so if you go to those very high energy, you could start doing uh, astronomy using charged particles. And then, of course, we, you, don't see the source, you don't see the sources, but you start seeing that there is an anisotropy, and most probably uh, those particles are coming from a direction which is opposite to the direction of the galactic center. So most probably those particles come from outside the galaxy <clears throat> and with a significance more than five sigma. <laughs> and this is what was actually expected. The future, uh, these extreme energies might come from having a larger exposure. Uh, in the jargon of cosmic crazy exposure is oh, okay. It's a sort of uh, integrated luminosity. So you, you have the acceptance times the observation time. <laughs> so it's a measure of the statistics that you have. If you want many, uh, much more events, so to reach higher energies uh, or to better study the anisotropies, you need a jump in the exposure. And you see the exposure of Auger and the exposure of some projects that are proposed here. Uh, one of these is called Poema. In this case, you, um, you use space-based experiments again, but looking downward. So these are telescopes that are getting this scintillation light produced by showers in the atmosphere, the fluorescence light, um, it, but monitoring at the same time a huge surface. So instead of having uh, 3,000 square kilometers, uh, as in the case of Auger, you monitor at the same time with the same instrument a surface which is two orders of magnitude uh, larger, and then you have a jump in statistics, and then you might reach larger energies and study anisotropies. And this, in, this is then the end of the story. Uh, so the message is that the, there are continuous and steady improvements in the field. Uh, we, have, uh, we got new answers, but also the results as always raise new questions. And then we had many unexpected results. In all this, of course, uh, uh, which is most important maybe for uh, experimentalists, uh, once you have new tools, you can uh, build uh, better experiments and then you have new observables and typically you always uh, have new results. So new tools and new idea will make the difference as always. Thank you.